This morning, in preparation for our time of communion, uh, we're going to look briefly into God's Word. Uh, if you don't have a Bible this morning, we have some gentlemen who are coming down the aisle. And uh, just raise your hand, and they'll make sure that you receive a copy of it. If you don't have a copy of your own, you're welcome to keep it as our gift to you. There are evangelical Christians today who advocate that a person can be a Christian, can believe in Christ, without any evidence of a changed life. But yet the scripture very clearly teaches that genuine saving faith always results in godly living. Experiencing God's grace in Christ will transform the way a person lives. This morning, I want to briefly examine a passage that teaches this very truth. It's a passage that is a clear response to any theology that promotes a separation of salvation from a godly life, from submission to Christ. So turn with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Titus, whom he left in Crete to complete the work that he started. He instructs Titus in this letter to appoint elders in the church, to teach sound doctrine, and to encourage believers to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now, after exhorting Titus to instruct various members in the church how to live in verses 1 to 10, in verses 11 to 14, Paul gives the reasons for these instructions. Notice what he says. For the grace of God has appeared. The reason why believers in the church, older women, younger women, older men, younger men, or slaves, are to display these qualities in their lives is because God's grace has appeared. The word grace means undeserved merit. It means re receiving something that we don't deserve. God's grace has, God has always been a God of grace. He's always demonstrated undeserved grace or favor towards man ever since creation. But yet, that hasn't always been very clear or evident, especially during the Old Testament. Paul states here that the great God's grace has appeared. The grace of God, which previously was invisible, which was hidden, which was concealed at some specific point of time in history, became clearly visible. It was brought out of the shadows and into the light. Paul is here referring to the appearance of Jesus Christ in human history. He's referring to the incarnation of Christ when God himself took on human form. See, Jesus Christ is the grace of God. He is the grace of God personified. He is the expression of God's grace to man. So here in verses 11 to 14, Paul tells us that when the grace of God appeared, it provides us three things. First of all, in verse 11, the grace of God provides us salvation. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, in the New Testament language, the word bringing doesn't appear in the text. It literally reads, for the grace of God has appeared, salvation to all men. See, in Paul's mind, there is an inseparable link between the incarnation of Christ and salvation of man. Jesus Christ, God himself, came into this very world for the very specific purpose to provide salvation for man. He came to die on the cross as that sinless sacrifice to be our substitute. The appearance of Jesus Christ in human history resulted in salvation to all men. It was the provision of salvation for man. You see, without the appearance 
of the grace of God, there would be no salvation for man. Now, we need to understand that in this verse, Paul is not teaching universalism. He's not saying that in the end, everybody is going to be saved in heaven. He's referring to the universal offer of salvation. Scripture teaches that anyone, regardless of the person's age, their class, their gender, their ethnicity, who believes in him will be saved. They will have their sins forgiven. They will receive eternal life. Now, the grace of God not only provides salvation to all who believe, but notice the grace of God provides instruction for the present. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present age. The grace of God that appears bringing salvation also is our instructor. It teaches us how we're to live. So as believers, we are enrolled in the school of God's grace throughout our lives. The grace of God instructs us in two areas. Notice, God's grace instructs us negatively to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. We are to reject ungodliness. We're to say no to ungodly and sinful behaviors, those things that oppose God's will and God's character. We are to reject worldly and sinful desires. We're to say no to desires and cravings that originate from this world that are not from the Father. Not only does God's grace instruct us negatively, but notice it also instructs us positively. See, the Christian life is not just about denying things, saying no. It's about saying yes to those things that honor, please, and glorify God. So we are to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We're to live sensibly, that's referred to inwardly, to have self-control in our life. It talks about our conduct in relationship to ourselves. We're to live righteously, this outwardly, in our conduct before others. We're to live godly, that is upward, our conduct in our relationship to God, to make sure that we are living a life that honors God. This is how we are to live now in this world until the Lord takes us home to heaven. The grace of God not only provides us salvation, it provides us instructions for the present, but the grace of God provides us orientation for the future. Look at verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. The grace of God that appeared in the past will one day reappear in the future. Paul here is referring to the glorious return of Jesus Christ. Because Christ promised that one day he would return and take those of us who belong to him into heaven. He also promised that one day he would establish his kingdom on earth and eventually rule on the throne forever. As believers, we are to look forward to this glorious return of Christ, which Paul calls our blessed hope. We're to look forward to it with eager expectation. So when we look forward to the reappearance of God's grace, it provides orientation of our life towards the future. It sets our minds on the things above, not things on earth. It provides us hope uh, as we live in this fallen world. It keeps our focus on things that are eternal rather than things that are temporal. It reminds us that our life here on earth is short. It puts our trials, our hardships, our suffering into perspective. It reminds us that this is not our real home, but our home is in heaven. It reminds us the best is yet to come. The Apostle John teaches us that when we fix our eyes upon this hope of his return, 
It's going to purify our lives. It's going to motivate us to live a godly life. Paul concludes in verse 14 and reminds his readers of the reason why God's grace appear, bringing salvation. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The purpose why Jesus Christ redeemed us is so that he can purify a group of people who belong only to him, who are eager to do good works, who are eager to do those things that expand his kingdom and bring him glory. The Lord's Supper, the communion, is a time for us as believers to remember God's grace that appeared 2,000 years ago. It's a time for us to remember what he did on the cross for our salvation. The bread is a symbol that reminds us of his blood, of his body, excuse me, which was crucified on the cross. The cup is a symbol that reminds us of his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Every time we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we are affirming the fact in our hearts that Christ died for us. He is the one who provided us salvation. It's also a time for us to examine ourselves, to make sure that we're living in light of the grace of God, that we're saying no to ungodliness and sinfulness, that we're striving to live a righteous and a godly life, that we're looking forward eagerly to his return. If we're not, then we need to confess and repent of it before we participate in the communion. It's also a time for us to remember, to remind ourselves that he will one day return and complete our salvation. He's going to redeem our bodies. It says, for as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we invite you to join us in our time of communion. If you're here this morning and you haven't believed in Christ, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then this time of remembrance is not intended for you. Let me encourage you not to take the elements of the communion but simply to pass them along and to use this time to think about the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. You can be saved from the penalty of sin simply by believing in Jesus Christ alone and in no one else and in nothing else. If you never believed in Christ, let me invite you and encourage you to believe in him right now. If you have any questions, I would invite you to talk with the person who invited you or to one of the elders or the pastors of the church. Let's take a moment and examine ourselves to make sure that we're participating in the communion in this time of remembrance in a worthy manner. After you receive the elements, when you're ready, when your heart is prepared, take the elements on your own. Gentlemen, would you please come and serve us the elements?